So I uh, want to thank Heidi for that great overview. And I'm sure that a lot of questions. So Jabina teacher, um, uh, Jabina teacher will help me moderate from the floor. Uh, so if you can identify a few questions, a few people who wish to ask questions from the floor, then we will go to those on the Zoom. And then, as I said at the beginning, uh, I will ask Professor Kader to say a few words. So is there, Jabina? Would you help to identify? I can't see the whole audience, so. My name is Jay Kumar. Thank you, Dr. Heidi Lane, for that informative piece of information that I got regarding education in uh, Finland. I've always admired the system of education in Finland because it is considered to be one of the best in the world, especially the primary education. Instead of a uh, question, I, what I would like to know is if you could enlighten us on some of those features of the primary education system in Finland, vis -a -vis the, uh, whether there is something called the child relevance over there, how the transportation is being managed in the schools, how free is the accessibility of education in Finland? And when you talk of the digital thing, that is children moving away from reading, etc. Sweden has introduced something new now. That is, they have restricted the time that the child or the parents spend on the internet or the smartphones. There's a lot of restrictions in Sweden now. Whether Finland is also following the same path or there is something different that Finland is thinking about. And another thing I want to know is that the system that prevails in Finland, not only in Finland, in Sweden, Denmark and other Scandinavian countries as well, the welfare model. How far the welfare model that has been established by social democracy has sustained over these years and laid the firm foundation for such a system of education where it is built on trust and confidence. That, it would be nice if you could tell us more about that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's a, a big question to start with. Like after the Second World War, uh, the Nordic countries started to build this Nordic welfare model, which is kind of tied to the social political uh, system in the society with the free access to health and uh, education. In Finland, the free access to education came in the 1970s. So little by little, when once the country started to develop, this is also something that um, that kind of like may give some hope when we think about it, that after the Second World War, Finland was really poor rural uh, society. And uh, for the need to develop, as a country and as a nation. By the 70s, uh, there was this uh, big will to have a free education system for all the children. It was something that nobody could dream of, but it became reality and it is reality. So if we think of the also our dear planet at the moment and the climate change, we need to think what are, you know, what are the utopias, the kind of concrete utopias that we can think of for the future that actually can become true. This Finnish education system is, is one a good example that it became true. It's a free education, free access. Also, the students are provided free lunch. Nowadays, with this uh, responsibility to learn age being up to 18, all the learning materials, school lunch is free for the children and youth up to age 18. The thing about Finland is that because we have these school catchment areas, we don't have school transportation. So children walk to the school and they walk home. If the children uh, school uh, travel, if the parents choose school outside of the school catchment area, if it's uh, over, I think, three kilometers, then they get a free public transportation bus ticket. So we have a quite well-established public transportation system. The children walk on their own to the school. So that kind of like that's also the trust in the society that we have quite safe uh, for the children to move around. Of course, nowadays, 
uh, the world, I mean, also in Finland is not a safe net, net in, in that sense anymore. Things happen, but it is relatively safe still. So these are kind of the, the, the features. And I think uh, I cannot emphasize enough the professionalization of the teachers, the teacher education, teachers professional development, uh, having that impact, that kind of is, is also foundation for the trust, but also this uh, social welfare model that, that people can trust that to some extent the society will take care of them no matter what. But at the moment, as I speak and sit here, um, you may have read from the news that our government currently is not, not a social democratic government. So the government is taking a lot away from the social welfare. So there's not a, any group in the society that is not touched at the moment. So, so there is a great concern also at the moment going on in terms of the Finnish society and the, the welfare model that we have had for all these years. So, so these are the changes that are currently taking place and we don't know about the future. I hope I answered, yeah. Thank you, thank you. There, there are a few questions from, shall I go to the Zoom, uh, Jabina? Uh, yes, Ajita, after that we'll come to the floor. Yeah, so there are a few questions in the chat and uh, I think it's more efficient if I just ask them. So one question is, what is the monitoring system uh, of school education in Finland? How are schools monitored in Finland? We have this uh, Finnish national, uh, hold on, what is it called? It's Karvi in Finnish, Finnish National uh, Evaluation Center for education. So they have a uh, different type of evaluations of the education system, but the schools are not monitored in that sense, but they are more like evaluating the quality of education overall. But we, we've, I mean, I guess this idea of the trust and teachers professionalization, the strong foundation for it, we don't have such monitoring system. Not for the schools, not for the teachers, not for the students. Students, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Okay. Another question is, um, okay, that um, I like the way they treat the kids without academic competition and exam-free education. So this is a parent who is homeschooling her kids. So she is asking, how can we incorporate such methods into our homeschooled kids? I yeah, I think I mean education is always education. It, it's a bit difficult question for me mm -hmm. because I, I'm not so familiar with the homeschooling. But I think homeschooling is also a wonderful way of of providing children a, a foundation for education in terms of like created. Creative learning methods, uh, I think they can take place everywhere under any kind of circumstances in, in Finland because we have a lot of forest, for, for example, around us because we are such a small population. So it's one of the ways that, that it's used as a learning environment. It's used, used a lot for the younger children exploring, for example, geometry, looking into the leaves and, and shapes and things from the nature object. Object. I mean, there's very many, like, very concrete. I've also seen in a classrooms here very concrete, uh, creative learning methods that are very easy to take also into home learning. So it's more about the foundation. And again, I think in a sense, like, like for those who teach the children, they interest towards uh, also providing some some kind. I mean, keeping up their own uh, interest towards teaching, but also, of course, it does require the society around to support the teachers at schools. So I'll take two more questions from Zoom, and then we'll come back to the to Professor oh. Kader first. So um, one question is, is a highly educated teacher more effective at their job or 
is it enough to have a moderately educated teacher who's willing to learn alongside their students and become potentially a better educator? Well, I hope that our, I mean, if we talk about high, highly educated teachers, that the teachers would also, uh, in a sense, be humble in understanding that no matter how highly educated we are, we are never ready as human beings or, or as, as teachers. So, so that's kind of the idea of the continuous uh, uh, teacher's development. And, and that's kind of the idea that, that, that we are not ready when we graduate. I think we cannot, it, often when you he, hear Finnish, for example, scholars talking about Finnish education system, they also say that we choose the, you know, we can choose the best teachers. I who come with a research background on social inequalities, it, it's a bit painful for me to hear this statement because my question is always that who are the best teachers? Because also if you look at the structures of student teachers, they don't, it doesn't represent this whole society in Finland. So then there are children and youth who think that, you know, we cannot be the best teachers because we don't look like the Finnish in terms of, for example, skin color. So I think when we talk about the highly educated or, or best teachers, we really have to be critical. <laughs> How we, how we talk, what kind of discourses we also take on in education. So I believe that the, I mean, the teachers who are motivated to continue yes. stay developing as a teacher and, and, and they kind of sense of, of love and caring for the students. That is the key. That's, that's true. So let me, let me take one more question from the, from the Zoom. At what age do we begin teaching English to young learners in Finland? And are they taught English through Finnish or Swedish, which is the two indigenous languages, I mean, in, uh, native languages? Uh, yes, we. it depends. Nowadays, there are these integrated programs that already maybe on a first and second grade, they, uh, students are introduced to the first foreign language. Often it is English, but because we have the two official languages, Finnish and Swedish, uh, we um, we also need to study. If you're Finnish speaking, you have to study Swedish. If you're Swedish speaking, you have to study Finnish. And those are taught kind of as a foreign languages. We have also option of studying German, French, Russian, Chinese, a lot of variety of languages that we can, the children can study as foreign languages. And yes, they are taught by as foreign languages through the Finnish or Swedish language. But we have also actually um, kind of a, a, minority languages, indigenous languages in Finland, which is the, the Sami language, a population that is quite discriminated, I mean, kind of kept outside, had not have been given as much uh, uh, access in terms of a language and cultural heritage. We have also Roma community that is very much discriminated in the Finnish society. So they are kind of also invisible in our education system. So we have this also our own kind of minority languages that are not visible. Swedish language has a much stronger position in the hierarchy of the languages in the system and in the in, in the school. So, so I mean, these things, when we talk about Finnish education, it's not a perfectly functioning system. And I think there are a lot of things that I have learned during my trip here. I was in Bangalore before, and now I'm here also in terms of that, like language uh language integration because you have so many languages and and, yes. and they quite flexibly are used so i think this is one thing that i really think um we have a lot to learn sajita a few more questions from the floor so i uh, before we go to that uh, i think it would be good to call upon professor kader to say yeah. is he is he a, there Uh, to say a few words about Exagita, a few more questions from the floor. Can we have that? Uh, yeah, but I I was wondering if Professor Kader could say a few words and then we can have the questions. And then and the then floor. later. Yeah. Okay. With the with the questions from the floor and additional questions from Zoom. But, uh, but I would like Sajita. to give the 
Sajita Khadar sir is telling he'll have it later after the questions okay. from the floor. Okay. He wants it that way. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Then you call on the yes. people. Yes, ma'am. Please. Uh, thank you very much, madam, for your excellent presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Hedy, madam. Uh, from long, I was looking for a talk of... Uh, this uh, uh, fin Finnish education system. Uh, it was really nice to hear from you that the teachers are all postgraduates, you told. And uh, is that degree makes the teacher a real quality teacher? That is my question number one. Is that qualification, postgraduate qualification, makes a teacher really quality teacher? Question number one. And because human feeling creating in the mind of a child is the best education and yours is supposed to be the best education and teacher competency, commitment and performance based. These three are very important. A teacher may be good in her performance, but poor in her competency and commitment. So qualification and that teacher quantity uh, performance, competency, and commitment, all this relation, is there any way of judging or evaluating them after this post-graduation degree of the teachers in Finland? One question. Second, that is, that is, they have to see the growth of three H, head, heart, and hand of the child. Are they looking to that? Degree alone will not matter. Just now also someone asked. Degree alone, the humane feeling incorporating in the child from development stage is of great importance. Even in our, I'm a retired hand, excuse me. Even in our education system, many, many new education policy also introduced. You must have seen everything is there in that but are we concentrating on the value which has to be incorporated in the child from the lower age? That is one very, very, very important question for me. I had a, a time, I stayed with a Finland, uh, uh, Finnish uh, teacher in Tata Institute of Social Science. There was, a, uh, there was a conference some years back, maybe some eight uh, years or 10 years back. She said, our education, we were together in the same room. Our education system is excellent. We are like IAS officers in our, uh, in our country. Everything she spoke about, from that day itself, I am very keen to come to Finland and to have an observation of the system. Here now many questions have come, how the other systems, everything is. So, madam, my question is mainly this. Whatever be the qualification of the teacher, be, because I have a... 40 years experience in teaching profession and I was in the teacher training college. Whatever be the qualification a teacher has, unless and until she has incorporated this competency, commitment and performance equally, her performance to my opinion is not satisfactory. I have also experienced with people and I had a research work on that and I concluded that though you are highly qualified, competent, and committed. If performance is poor, it will not shine. The teacher may not be a quality teacher. She will be a teacher. That's all. Okay. That is my first question. Okay. I have another question also. Are you, did you introduce STEM education or STEAM education in your school system? Yes, ma'am, please. Thank you. Please, please keep it up. So, two questions I asked. That's so, all. Thank you. Yes, I think that is the most difficult question is that what is a quality of teachers? Um, and, and I mean, whether the teacher education is, is something that, that provides it fully. Um, that it, it's really difficult to, and, and as what I, I think it goes back to what I was also saying that when we say talk about that we get the best teachers that you know what does it mean you know what are the qualities of a best teacher I think we should first talk about that 
And that's exactly the truth that, you know, what are the values, what are the worldviews uh, of a teachers? I think what I would say more what our education system gives is also the societal value for the teachers, teachers as professionals. So, and that's also where the trust comes that the, somehow the parents trust and, and, and if the parents, I mean, if the parents see that their child is not learning, they can address it with the teacher and with the teacher's qualification, they should be able to kind of guide the parents further how, and, and also be able to provide at school this, uh, help the support system that is uh, written in our national curriculum. However, whether all the teachers are good quality, uh, I uh, don't think that that is the, the truth. Uh, and, um, and, and I mean, I think that is something that, that is very interesting to this. I mean, the discussion to take on that, you know, what are the qualities, what makes a teacher good quality? teacher. I, when I have done oh, classroom observations, I have noticed that teachers who have somehow struggled themselves at some point with learning, they are the ones who can also best support those students who are struggling. So this is also a question in Finnish system, but that because we get the best, those who have always done well at school, are they the best teachers to teach the whole world in their classroom? That's my big question. I don't have an answer for this, but this is always the question I ask when I hear this, that we choose the best teachers. So, yeah, I in that sense, like, I, I would love to continue this conversation. What comes in terms of the, the sustainability issues? Um, maybe also you hear that we have great policies in place, but as I was also, we were, we've been discussing this theme during this trip that also I think as in Finland, we don't have the climate change touching our skin so much yet. So we are quite carelessly using the resources, also resources in the global south and in other parts of the world. So there's a lot of awareness, I think, that we need everywhere. And, and also in, in my own context, in terms of the sustainability and, and, and STEM issues. All right. Thank you, Heidi. First of all, thank you, Dr. Heidi Ling, ma'am, and thank you, VMFT, for this wonderful session. Ma'am, uh, you have already told that there is a lot of private textbook agencies as there, and the school have the right to choose any textbook from yeah. that. So my question is, is there any authority to supervise or monitoring these textbook agencies that whether they follow the policies of the government or whether they follow the theoretical basis of Finnish education system? And my second question is, uh, you, ha you have already told that Finnish education system promote lifelong learning. So what's the role of adult education in Finnish education system? Thank you. What is adult that? education. Adult. 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 Thank you. Yes. Yes. But now I've forgot the, the first part. <laughs> Textbooks. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, we don't have a system for monitoring. I think this is where the teacher education comes in, that the teachers are quite critical of the textbook. So actually the textbook writers and the commercial companies, they have a lot of responsibility. Again, the responsibility producing good quality because otherwise the schools won't buy into their books. They choose some other books. So this is where the teacher's qualification comes, that the teachers are critical consumers of the textbooks. Yeah, of course, this is again uh, now when, we, I mean, teachers have le more uh, options to choose earlier. Now with the financial struggle, it may be teacher who chose some book three years ago and the teachers don't have choice always, but it, there is a critical audience of teachers in terms of the school book. So, so they need to be good quality without monitoring. And then for the adult education, uh, we have, uh, because, I mean, for example, from the vocational education, we have three like different uh, tracks of vocational. So there's the basic and then you can go further. But also from the vocational education, you can go to the to the uh, universities of applied sciences. So in that sense, that's one form of, of a uh, adult education. A lot of the uh, adults with um, vocational qualification nowadays go into further day education because it's, it's, it started in 1995 when we started to build this two, three, 
to track higher education system. So it has contributed to that other education. We have also in a, a quite uh, good system for like informal learning. There are these uh, like workers, institutions where you can do kind of a lot of hobby based of language learning, arts, different type of things that people do just to keep their mind <laughs> active. Uh, so in that sense, education is something that is very uh, much uh, incorporated into the lifestyle of, of Finnish people. So it's also like for any profession, even for cleaners, you have to have some kind of vocational certification. In Finland, it's really difficult to survive if you don't have any qualification uh, beyond the basic education or beyond the matriculation examination. So there is a kind of strong, but after said this, also our government at the moment is reducing a lot of funding from the vocational education and, and from all, all sectors, but especially on this uh, adult education. Also, we have had uh, this uh, adult education fund that if you have wanted to take a leave from work and and and, uh, and yeah study, you have had a, a fund from funds from the government, but that's uh, taken away at the moment. So, so we have uh, these challenges at the moment. So I should say that it the system has been strong, but for the future, maybe in ten years, I I wouldn't be able to say the same things anymore. <laughs> Uh, I would uh, like. There are a few questions on on Zoom. Uh, Jabina, yeah, what do you suggest? Uh, one question. Two, two are there on the floor, ma'am. Okay. Can we pass it on to them and then go to the Zoom? Yeah. Uh, so you have mentioned that uh, the education system is in Finland is completely publicly funded, but I would like to ask. To what extent market can intervene in education system and how is market intervening and influencing the education system, especially school education system? Yeah, that's a very good question because it is it is coming in there. So we have had this uh, idea of a, a long childhood, a lot of emphasis on childhood uh, being long, not much homework. But I think with what, the, for example, the... PISA assessments and and and, and PISA. these have yes yes have done. Do you uh, have that PISA assessment? Do you all have PISA? Yes, we we take. I mean, we are part of the the PISA, and that's how the Finnish education became uh, kind of known in the world. Uh, but we also, I mean, currently also maybe you know that our PISA results are a bit decreasing. But in in that sense, like the private sector, private tuition. It is not taking place a lot, but it is there and there is a kind of a fear that it is coming in more. The more what it is in early childhood education that we, in Finland, you cannot, we don't have private schools, so you cannot start a private school, but you can start a private early childhood education center. And that's where we also nowadays have this struggle that uh, that we are getting this private um uh, actors but it's very difficult because we have so strong the government system so it's very difficult to make money out of the children so then the quality is sacrificed yeah. so so there are these uh conversations going on at the moment in terms of university admission nowadays there are a lot of tuition centers helping students because universities have entrance examination so this is really like again like there's a lot of discussion that because we always say that everybody can get into higher education but now those who get go to the tuition centers get uh, preparation for the university exams they have better opportunities and then it becomes that you know do all the families have money to pay for their children to prepare them for for the university, so it is coming. It is not much discussed, so that's why I really like this question. But it is coming there, so, so it's there's also a kind of a critical evaluation needed from the academics and from the society. Dr. Heidi, when I was listening to your uh, your presentations, I was comparing our curriculum, that means Kerala education curriculum, with the Finnish systems. You said. Then I find the main difference with the student choice and examination system. But rest of the vision and approaches 
uh, I think I, I always wonder that we have the we have the same visions and things in our curriculum also. But when it uh, put it to practice, when we uh, feel it from the ground reality, it is totally different. That is this is a, uh, this stands like a dream apart from this old vision and text and all. But my question uh, in this context, my question is that. Uh, you said that up to ninth grade, ninth grade, uh, there is no exams. Uh, the students have the choice after ninth grade, and they choose either vocation or uh, matriculation exams and so on. So here, uh, how can the teachers ensure after completing a grade? Uh, how can the teacher ensure uh, that the children has uh, fulfilled their learning gap? That means the children are uh, different in their capabilities, and we know that the as they are different in their capabilities, there must be some learning gaps also. So after the end of the grade, how can a teacher ensure that the learners, uh, that means that teacher can fill, could, uh, do the, uh, could fill those learning gaps. And also one of my curiosity as I'm a teacher educator is that how uh, the Finnish education system prepare the student teachers before they go for the practices in school. Thank you for the question um if i uh well although we don't have national examinations the teachers do test the children they assess the children so starting from i think it's nowadays from the fourth grade onwards they get numeric evaluation on different subjects the numeric evaluation is from four to nine four being failed not i mean sorry four to ten ten being the best uh and then on the ninth grade, they uh, get something like um, end of basic education uh, school report. And based on that average score, they can apply to different uh, upper secondary schools. So that's kind of also the first place where actually the student need to think that, okay, how well I have done, what are my opportunities, which upper secondary school is possible because different upper secondary schools have different average score level to enter. The same applies to the vocational education. There are some uh, fields in vocational education that are very uh, much favored amongst youth. So the youngsters, they need to kind of do research what is possible for them in terms of the, the choice. But in terms of the choice, there's no uh, dead ends, whether you go to the vocational or, or to the upper secondary you can still end up to the higher education. So although we don't have national examinations and comparisons, the students are still tested and evaluated. And before the teachers did have this difficulty that, you know, what uh, entitles grade six, what uh, entitles grade seven, eight, nine, ten, for example. So therefore, our national curriculum very recently uh, incorporated this um, requirements like what is requirement in different subject for different grade numbers so so that the teachers have an idea and, and also that the evaluation would be more equalized because again we can think of you know what is equal and what is equal in terms of evaluation that if they have completely freedom or if there are guidelines so now there is this new system uh, incorporated where the where the national curriculum gives guidelines how does the student performance needs to be in different num num numeric uh, gradings for different subjects? Thank you. Thank you. And you had another question. <laughs> yes, Th there are different type of practicums early on. So the first, what they do, they don't go to teach, but first they go to the teacher training schools to observe. So they observe and they reflect with their peers and with the university teachers and they uh, do kind of analysis. And then they go and, and, and in the beginning of the practicum, they first, first only observe. Then after a while, they take the responsibility over the teaching. So they are kind of little by little uh, incorporated into the system. And of course, also the courses in the university are supporting them towards the practicum. Right, thank you. I think there's just one more question on the floor, Sajita, please excuse. Okay, after that we must go because yeah, one yeah. on, oh. one's on Zoom. Okay. 
Good morning, ma'am. My name is Zizida Gilton. I am from the Department of Education. As you have mentioned sustainability here, and it's the most discussed topic nowadays. And we believe that uh, teachers are uh, eminent personalities who can bring a change in society. So does Finland have an education system or something like that to enhance the sustainability literacy among these student teachers? And if so, what are you following to do? Yeah, well, I mean, having the climate change pedagogy research project, I think this is a really important question because we are also looking into how would the curriculum need to look like in terms of the, the supporting the climate change. And we know that the climate change is not something that happens in the only in the environment, but it has also a lot of social and cultural impact. So I think what, when we write curriculum, we need to really look into the what are the local circumstances in terms of the the climate change and how it's also impacting the the society the different uh, groups in the society and whose voices are incorporated in into the curriculum because it's not we cannot change the environment if we don't support the kind of the local local uh, communities and then also, I mean, listening to the global communities because we are in some sense always tied also to the global system. But it is very important in terms of, the, I think, the sustainability that we understand what are the local circumstances and also thinking how we can incorporate those voices that are not in the curriculum in terms of the uh, climate change and, and kind of creating uh, more sustainable futures. Okay, okay, thank you.